guys really out here. I've, thanks to Les and Jason, wherever you are, I think in the booth, and I guess Crystal Wilkinson, because she was supposed to be here, and I apologize to those of you who were expecting Crystal, uh, and you have to deal with me this morning. But uh, Creative Morning makes sense to me, uh, because I'm usually most creative in the morning. The hard part is that I don't usually engage with other human beings. So that'll be the challenge. Of, so if I shut down for any moment, it'll be because I had a flashback and I think I'm home working. Um, but when I think about context, I've, for me as a poet, context is all that stuff that I have to say to you before I read a poem. Uh, all the things I have to consider to make a piece of art uh, communicate or make sense. And I'm going to share some things with you that uh, comes more out of the, <coughs> excuse me, the classroom experience. Uh, because as much as I, I love writing and creating art, it doesn't pay the rent. Uh, teaching does. Uh, I'm going to give you a taste of, of how I torture my students uh, by torturing you and, and hopefully pull you into to an exchange. If not a dialogue, you, you get to participate uh, this morning. Uh, one of the things that for me makes the most sense is just this simple phrase, uh, what we see when we look depends on the context or how it's presented. Um, some of our personal experiences or additional context affects how we perceive what we see. That makes only a little sense, but I'm going to illustrate that for you. Uh, what is that? This is your turn. A line. Now, a line is the perfect response if this was a, a science or, or math class, but because I'm in the creative uh, spectrum, of when I ask you what something is, I really mean uh, what could it be? Uh, what could it represent? What, what is its potential? For instance, can you see a, a flagpole with no flag? Now see how quickly that happened? Uh, it stopped being just a line, and now it's about its potential. Uh, what, what else do you see? An opening. an opening. Notice that it went from a flagpole to an opening, and that opening could be very literal, like you can pull that apart and step in, or it could be abstract, uh, an opening to some other place or some other dimension. Uh, that thing could represent division, uh, two sides to something. What other concrete things do you see? Corner. corner, like that space where two walls meet in the room, that corner. Can you see that? Notice how when I add the additional words or the context, it starts to make even more sense for you. Uh, what if I told you that was a number one? You see it. What if I said it's a number eight? You shake your heads, right? But what if I said if it was a very skinny number eight turned sideways? <laughs> that, that additional context made you see it, and that's the thing that's important when the words are considered. Uh, what about now? What do you see? What's its potential? A door. A door. Anybody else see a door? I see a few nods. Shadow. Shadow. Upside down seven. A no, cartoon nose. How about that same flagpole and its shadow? Can you see that? If that's the case, what time is it? You know how the sun works, right? Trace it that direction. It's about 10, 30, almost 11 o'clock. Uh, but it's also, for a certain age group, it's also 3 o'clock, right? The big hand and the little hand, you see, you see that? Some of us learn to t tell time that way. Uh, <laughs> move the paper hands around. This whole digital generation has no idea what, what I mean when I say this 3 o'clock. <laughs> what, what about now? A swing. 
Vaz. Still the nose. How about a pants leg? Elephant leg. The space between two tall buildings. A grave. Upside down wicket when you play croquet. So you see those things. How about now? Been behind this truck on the highway? If it's the span of the book, uh, what book is it? War and Peace. It's dictionary. But it also could be the front of a really tall book, right? Of bird's eye view of a table. You can see that, right? Your head, brain did all that manipulating all by itself. Uh, here's the last version of this. What about now? What do you see? Kleenex box. Do not disturb signs. Somebody's been in a hotel. Bird's eye view of a sink. Doorknob. Doorknob. Doorbell. Peephole. See all those things? Your imagination, in my opinion, is what really gives us fuel. Uh, but sometimes there are things that you, you just don't see until somebody gives you the right words. I did this exercise in a prison, and the first thing a gentleman said was, staring down the barrel of a 45. I'd never looked down the barrel of 45, but when I turned around, there was a big gun looking at me. I've, some of you saw that as soon as I said it. It's the words that made it happen. It, no, real, no real magic. I've, you can go the opposite direction. Can you see a full moon out the window? Right? And you didn't see it before, but now you see it. I've, I made you see it, or I helped you see it, by simply using the right words, the right combination of words that triggered something in your brain. Of, but the chances are it really takes your experience, your personal experience, to see some things. If you've been, say you've been in prison in, in isolation for the last 40 years, and I told you that this was an iPod. You can see an iPod. Uh, but if you had no context, because you're in prison, you cannot see an iPod. It would take a whole conversation to explain Apple and I everything to get you to see iPod. Uh, a lot of what I do is about trying to put images in the same space and get you to see them differently, to see them in a different way, uh, to challenge how you see them. Sometimes those images happen with just the words on the page. Sometimes they happen with actual images. Some of you know I'm also a visual artist. Uh, I'll share some of those images at the very end, but here are two images that I think are polarized. Uh, the one on the left was taken about two blocks from here, a week after the monuments were removed from, from downtown. This gentleman was walking down Main Street with his flag, uh, very proudly displaying it and stopping traffic of right here in, in our Lexington, my Lexington, in 2017. Uh, the second image is from a book of, of like images. This is also set in Kentucky, a Kentucky that people have a hard time believing is actually Kentucky's history. Kentucky's history, Kentucky's present. Of, there's a way to get to that same place that I'm trying to get you to, and I'm going to share a piece of music with you. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do something different. When a song comes on, I want you to close your eyes and really listen at this, this particular piece of music that is two different songs paired together in a way you may not have heard them before. And these songs represent the same thing as these images of Dixie and Strange Fruit. This is by musicians whose name is Renee Marie. In the land of cotton, 
old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Well, I wish I was in Dixie. Hooray, 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 in Dixieland I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie. That's a long piece of music, but I wanted to get at least to the horns because for me, when I hear the horns, it's not that different from the woman's screams in the song. And if you're in this, this space trying to interpret what these visual images mean, uh, then those, those screams uh, take on a deeper meaning. Uh, and I think they inform, uh, they give you more context to understand what these things are about, even if you never experienced them. Uh, for the wind, for the wind to suck, for the sun It's one of the, the beauties of, of art, especially when it's combined with multiple art forms. Leave. That piece is called Dixie Strange Fruit, and that's Renee Marie from her Vertigo album. Um, I highly recommend it. And what you just experience is two oppositional images or pieces of art in the same space of what does that look like 
if you do that on, on the page, uh, the music, I think, changed the temperature in the room because it changed how you felt. It made many of you very uncomfortable when you realize that we're talking about those same things. Uh, this ugly part of Southern history, uh, this strange fruit, which is lynching, killing of, of, of black bodies. Uh, here's an example of the same thing in the same space uh, from a book called Tear Me Loose. Uh, and on the left, you may recognize this. This is two poems on the same page. Pick up a tool and beat white eggs, white sugar, dark corn syrup, vanilla extract, salt and butter, pour into a thin crust, cover with pecans, bake, let things cool, ready when brown and puffy. If you're a baker, you know that's a recipe for a pecan pie. Uh, and they may give you a warm feeling. You think about what happens in your house after dinner uh, when you get to the point of dessert. In the same space, using almost half of the same words, uh, is another example of what happens after dinner in a place called Money, Mississippi. And some of you already know the poem, how it ends, because you know the context based on what you know about Money, Mississippi, but some of you don't, so I'll read the other half for you. Pick up any nigger looking at white women or anything white but cotton. Wait until after dark. Extract the confession at gunpoint. Salt open wounds, pour into the Tallahatchie River, cover up the truth with a 75-pound cotton gin fan. Let things cool, ready when brown and puffy. That's literally the story of Emmett Till. And if you didn't know that, of when you get to that realization, it has a totally different temperature or feeling internally for you, uh, hopefully, if you're human, uh, than the left side, which is about evoking something warm uh, and intimate and familial versus this horrible thing. And these two things are in opposition. And it's almost impossible to have that happen on the same page. How do two oppositional forces coexist on the same page? Uh, that's one of my challenges as a writer. I believe it's, it is possible. Uh, I'm going to read you an example of how to do that. Uh, when I think about this, this binary, this, this kind of conversation between two forces uh, that this book represents. When people see the Confederate flag, that's the best example for me, uh, particularly in this part of the South. Some people still see a form of heritage, uh, a symbol of pride. Some people still see a racist image. Uh, this poem tries to represent it in three voices. The first voice on the left says, in the Old South, we would sit on the veranda look out over the horizon at the young who happily played behind, while their mothers sang rapture spirituals. Those were good old days. Not having to use the whip was more civilized than slavery. The other oppositional voice says, life was full of work. From sun up to sundown, nothing but fields of cotton. Children tried to pick their own weight. By age 13, filled 500-pound sacks and lived the blues. For plantation owners, sharecropping and extending debt was almost more profitable than slavery. And those voices clearly disagree about what that image is. Uh, but I offer you a third voice that's about what happens when you try to achieve something that feels or sounds like reconciliation. I want you to read this whole thing or see it as one voice in one poem, reading left to right. In the Old South, life was full of work. We would sit on the veranda from sun up to sundown, look out over the horizon at nothing but fields of cotton. The young children who happily played behind tried to pick their own weight, while their mothers by age 13 filled 500 pound sacks, sang rapturous spirituals and lived the blues. Those were good old days for plantation owners, not having to use the whip, sharecropping, and extending debt was more civilized, was almost more profitable than slavery. You like that? I know it's hard to clap for such darkness sometimes, uh, but this is called a contrapuntal. Uh, and all of my grad students are forced to write one before they leave the class. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like a, a Rubik's Cube for, for poets. 
uh, is not easy to pull off. But this is, is important that you try to take two polarized voices and try to unite them in some way, uh, which is a perfect metaphor for thinking about people who disagree. Uh, you know, how do you get two conflicting arguments or positions on the same page to get them to see the same thing, to be part of a unified voice? Uh, that's what reconciliation is about. Uh, you know, we've been told that it happened in South Africa. You know, there are programs that are trying to do it in the South. Um, I think we've only gotten part of the way there, you know, as evident by what's happening in, in the national politics. But uh, this is just an example of, of how to get there as a poet and as a writer. Um, one of the things that I do as a poet is try to figure out how to talk about these things. No matter what I'm writing about, I'm usually always trying to talk about identity, place, family, and social justice. In my opinion, and what I teach in the classroom is that you can write any poem if you pull from this, this place that is all about memory, research, imagination, and empathy. And empathy is probably the most important part because it requires you to imagine if you're in somebody else's shoes. You know, this art for me is not just not just poetry, it's, it's, it's a thing that becomes my art activism. Uh, even in this play, uh, this is a play I wrote called I Dedicate This Rise about Isaac Murphy, which was performed here uh, and Children's Theater for the first time and at the Lyric, first in 2010. Uh, you get a sense of the social justice, this identity, what it means to be black and male and in Kentucky in a space where if you're as far west as Washington State, people still ask you things like, are there other black people in Kentucky? Which is embarrassing to me, but it just means that I have work to do to get them to see beyond the Kentucky Fried Chicken commercials, to see past the media images that portray these spaces as all white uh, and unlettered and uncultured. Uh, well, we know we're the exact opposite of that. This is an example of some of my visual art. You can also see the same themes of popping up. You know, this is, this is the old painting, almost 25 years old, but it's really uh, a comment on, on police brutality. If you can kind of peer through, you can see this young man is, uh, is in a spread eagle position like he's being arrested. Uh, the light shining on him from behind uh, is also in the shape of a cross. Uh, if you have really great eyes, you can see the holes in his hands, so he's almost a Christ figure in this situation. Uh, there's more stuff there, but you know, I think art is up to the, to, to the viewer to interpret. Uh, I'll zoom through a few, few more examples of this visual art, which I have little time for these days, but I'm looking forward to creating more in the future, and, and close with a few poems. These are wooden assemblages. The one on the right is a, is a piece I called Mandela. Uh, I created uh, the same year that Nelson Mandela was released from, from prison. The piece on the left is called The Creation. That's just my hand. That's how I make my money. <laughs> uh, this is an abstract piece that represents uh, me, my daughter Nikki, and uh, my son Devan. But now that Devan is 6'3", I need to replace one of those shells with one as big as the one at the bottom. Um, this is an example of some of my photography. And that beautiful lady is my mother. And that also becomes the image uh, It's on the grace of the cover of ink stains and watermarks, which I'll close with. Um, I think I have time for maybe just one poem. I'm going to read the, the title poem called Ink Stains and Watermarks. And the context for this is that my mother grew up uh, very dark skinned uh, and ridiculed because of it. And it wasn't until she moved to New York and New Jersey uh, in her 40s and encountered uh, women from the Caribbean who had beautiful black skin and, and knew it uh, that she began to feel differently about her own self. Uh, ink stains and watermarks for Faith A. Smith. The color of ink squeezed from walnut holes. She was born too dark to be rocked to sleep at night. Her spine was not really too firm to be cradled and caressed. She was perfectly legible. Her mother just found her too hard to read. 
The car her father was driving did not crash. She did not fly through the windshield before children could be perfect bound. That was not a scar across her forehead. It was her publisher's colophon. It was an exclamation point dotted by her nose. It was the beginning of the sign of the cross. No ex-husbands, just a coffee stain and a slightly visible tear where two pages formerly yoked had been ripped apart. No miscarriage, just a chapter she wrote in haste that her editor rejected. She did not have a stroke when she carried me. She was just teaching me how to be still, to focus on each little sound, to grow up crazy in love with words. So she marked me, and now every time I open a book, I see her smiling face. Thank you. That's, that's not me. Does anyone have any questions? We have a few minutes for Q&A. Don't be shy. Questions, questions? What was the name of the... The name of the... Oh, yes. Uh, contrapuntal. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a modern form. Uh, in fact, the book of Turn Me Loose features uh, eight new modern forms that you didn't learn in school because they're not in the book yet. Contrapuntal, the hinge poem, uh, the extended haiku. Uh, thank you. It's, it's the poetic Rook's cue, but it is beautiful. I uh, work around giving Kentucky artists a voice in social issues. I, you know, I don't know that, that we have a choice. I don't think I'm giving, giving voice. I think I've been trying to encourage artists to use their voices. I think that even when art is intentionally uh, not political, it's political. Uh, you made a choice not to, to make a statement. But I think of artists and the art we create is really Kentucky's most precious commodity. Uh, and I know that for bourbon and horse fans, that's a, I'm, I'm really saying something that's sacrilegious. <laughs> but if you consider our literary treasures, uh, back to Robert Penn Moore and all the way forward to writers that include myself and, and my students, uh, you know, what we create will last forever, hopefully. Uh, but if we don't use those same voices to also recognize the injustices that are happening right in our own spaces, then, then we're helping to kill this place. Uh, so what I've been doing is trying to encourage my fellow artists uh, to speak up, to speak out, to, to do things that are not popular. You know, some people know that uh, the Appalachian Poets rejected a governor's awards in the arts. Uh, and we thought we were doing something that was just about us, but uh, we were so proud and pleased that we got so many compliments from fellow artists of, uh, it's almost like that particular event gave people permission to, to do the same thing, to, to also recognize that they have a voice. Of, you know, so we think artists should run for, for office. We think they should be on the school boards. Uh, they should be on local councils. They should run for Andy Barr's seat. Uh, you know, that this is the direction that we need to go if we ever want to be that place that uh, isn't famous for McConnell and, and, and Rand. And I think that's the thing that um, my friends outside of Kentucky keep asking me, uh, you know, what's going on in Kentucky? You know, then they point out those two individuals or even our governor or some of our, our politics. Of, and I think they have a mischaracterization of who's really here. But part of it is our fault because we haven't spoken up. We haven't actively participated in trying to change those perceptions of us uh, for ourselves and for people who look at us and make false assumptions, if that makes any sense at all. Yes? Uh, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about your creative process. How does a poem start for you? Uh, how do poems start? I pour a bowl of alphabets in a cup, 
I sat on the back porch every night and wake up every morning, there's a poem in it. I've, now, well, for me, the first impulses I get that are creative, I'm not sure they're going to be poems. Uh, my challenge is to figure out what's the best way to, to interpret it in order to share it with somebody else. Uh, my process includes trying to block off the mornings, including this one, uh, just for myself. Uh, I usually wake up at 4.30 in the morning without an alarm clock. My eyes just pop open. And I've been in some form of wakeness before that because there's an idea already percolating. And I usually, you know, after I stop in the men's room, go straight to my office and try to capture this stuff before I forget it. Um, but I'm a morning person. And, and also very engaged in the world around me. So the news affects me. Uh, I can't write at the end of the day because I'm so heavy with so much stuff. Um, so I have to, to go to sleep to kind of get a, a blank slate in my head and feel refreshed enough to take on things that are in the back of my mind. I might chew on a poem for a week before I write anything down. Um, but I'm always consciously trying to think about something or work on something. You know, I, I'm not sure what it means to, to not be active as a poet and a creative person. Yeah, sure. Uh, but I wanted to just say that Frank X will be in the lobby if you guys want to talk a little bit more and also buy a book. Okay, one more question. Uh, by Billie Holiday, because I think uh, she sang that song in 1940, so I, for those people who are older, probably they know. And are you aware of that song? Because uh, the newer one is, uh, you don't know Billie Holiday? Yes, I'm very well. Uh, uh, is that the question? Right, that version was R R Renee Marie. That wasn't Billie Holiday. But yes, it's based, based on her song. Uh, several artists have, have reinterpreted that song. Even some, some rap artists uh, have some versions of that. Uh, it's interesting is that it's still relevant this many years l later. Um, there are still public lynchings that happen uh, in the public spaces every day. Um, okay, we have our giveaway. And then, let's give uh, please do. Please do visit with Frank X and at his table with his book, and we'll talk some more. Okay, Jamie.